how modern humans got busy with each other, Neanderthals, and at least two other ancient human groups. Which begs the question, who wouldn't our ancestors get freaky with? Hmm. Hey guys, anatomically modern human Natalia Reagan here for D News. When our ancestors left Africa and trekked into Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, they crossed paths with other ancient human groups like Neanderthals, Denisovans, and at least one other group. Apparently, humans weren't so picky about their sexual partners, so they admixed science for getting down with these other ancient humans. How do we know? It's all in the genes. Scientists have been able to find DNA of these archaic humans in living populations today. This love story has four characters. First, Neanderthals. These hardy hominids lived in Europe, the Middle East, and Western Asia roughly 400,000 to 40,000 years ago. Because they lived in the harsh cold of Eurasia, far before modern humans left Africa, their biology was adapted to that climate. They had thicker and lighter skin, which helped with vitamin D absorption, a bigger nose designed to warm cold air, and a stockier build to retain heat. Very sexy, no? Second character in this love story? Well, in 2008, a new archaic human lineage was discovered in a Denisova cave in Siberia. Scientists found a finger bone with viable DNA and were able to sequence the genome. It turns out it belonged to a young adult female who lived roughly 30,000 years ago, and these new archaic humans were dubbed the Denisovans. Researchers have been able to find traces of Denisovan DNA in populations as far as Southeast Asia, stretching to Australia. This indicates that Denisovans and their descendants may have had a greater geographic area than previously thought. The third character in this love story? Well, that's technically anatomically modern humans, us. Uh, there is a fourth mystery guess, but we'll come back to them later. So in 2003, we sequenced the human genome. In 2010, we sequenced the Neanderthal and the Denisovan genome about the same time. Now that we've done all that, we can compare all this DNA. And the results were shockingly sexy. Scientists found Neanderthal DNA, Denisovan DNA, and that mystery group's DNA in current living populations. This is how we know that many people of Eurasian descent have a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA in their genome, like our very own trace. Natalia, do these genes make me look like a Neanderthal? Mm, give or take trace percent. But what were the potential benefits of a mixing with Neanderthals and Denisovans? Besides producing trace, of course. Really. When humans mated with these ancient groups, scientists argue that they picked up genes that improved their immune system and helped them adapt to a new environment. Researchers found that those of European and Asian ancestry had higher abundance of human leukocyte antigen genes, or HLAs. HLA is a protein that helps regulate our immune system. This is an example of hybrid vigor, or the tendency of a crossbred individual to show quality superior to those of both parents. And remember that fourth mystery group we danced around? Well, scientists have found another population of archaic humans that we got <clears throat> friendly with uh, when we migrated to Asia and down into Australasia. This unknown DNA has been found in populations of South Asians, Southeast Asians, and Australasians, including the population of the Andaman Islands. Roughly two to three percent of this unknown DNA has been found in individuals in the region. Researchers think that this new possible ancestor could help explain the shorter stature of people in those areas. These new data also support that there was only one wave of migration out of Africa into Asia rather than two waves, as is also hypothesized. DNA is truly fascinating. Not only is it the building blocks of an organism, it can tell you the story of a species' journey through time and space. Oh, and who they boned. And mixing with Neanderthals may have been good for our health, but research shows they were far smarter and artistic than previously given credit for. Check it out. What about you? Would you get down with a Neanderthal, a Denisovan, an unknown human ancestor? Come on, be honest. Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for D News every day of the week. Scientists might seem like the only group of people in the world who aren't really into a good gossipy sex scandal, but that, in fact, my friends, is not true at all. They love to talk about sex, especially when it's the sex lives of our prehistoric ancestors. So scientists are currently gossiping up a storm about uh, the fact that our early ancestors, the first Homo sapiens, may have uh, interbred with some other species, which is Weird. It's long been accepted by the scientific community that Homo sapiens, like me, and probably you, 
originated in Africa around 200,000 years ago. As far as we can tell, uh, they stayed there for about 140,000 years until they started to get frisky and struck out into the unknown. And one of the things that those adventurous humans discovered out there in the wide world was an older, more primitive, bigger boned species of great ape that we call Neanderthals. You may call them Neanderthals, but we in the scientific community call them Neanderthals because that's what they call themselves. Actually, it's because that's what the cave where their first fossils were found is called. It, it was a Neanderthal, not Neanderthal. It's just how they spell it. Neanderthals are, of course, related to humans, but their evolutionary lines had split about 350,000 years before. But just because Neanderthals and humans were not the same species, did that prevent them from getting it on? No, and it appears that we were similar enough species that we were actually able to create viable offspring. Studies have shown that despite the fact that Neanderthals went extinct about 40,000 years ago, they live on in us. According to this research, between 1 and 4% of human DNA is actually Neanderthal DNA. So you might as well unstitch your family crust from your smoking jacket. But Neanderthals might actually not be the only ancient hominids that uh, humankind had intimate relations with. The recently discovered Denisovans, which probably shared more in common with Neanderthals than with humans, are showing up in the genome of people all over Southeast Asia. So it turns out that we had a lot more choices of people, or you know, sort of people, to mate with back in the olden days. But we're not done messing with your conception of what humanity is yet, because it turns out that some of your ancestors may in fact have had sexy times with Gorillas, the reason they think this is not uh, to do with our genome, it's to do with the genome of lice. And stick with me, uh, because, yeah, I bet you're probably clicking away from the video right now. So most species of mammals have uh, one species of lice that's specific to them. It lives on them and only them, but all over them. Now, humans are a little different. Because we have um, isolated pockets of hair, we actually have two species of lice. We have head lice. We have pubic lice. And that's different from every other mammal's lice. But our pubic lice is very, very surprisingly and upsettingly similar to the species that lives on gorillas. No! God, no! Why did we even look into this? But, uh, even if our ancestors were having sex with the ancestors of the gorillas, well, hopefully they weren't, I'm still keeping that as a possibility in my mind. Uh, it probably was happening something like 3.3 million years ago. So you probably don't have to run straight to the shower and scrub your skin off with a pumice stone at the moment. But still, dang, Australopithecus, you dirty dog. If you ever want to watch an episode of SciShow again, and I understand if you don't, but if you do, please subscribe and you'll be able to learn more horribly disturbing facts like the ones that we learned today. Also, if you have questions or comments or ideas for other episodes of SciShow, you can get in touch with us on Twitter and on Facebook and of course in the comments below where we will always be uh, happily answering questions. We'll see you next time. There is a law. Look at that stylish exterior! Built like a true warrior. This fusion, it's unbelievable. I call shotgun! It worked! Look at that stylish exterior! Built like a true warrior. This fusion, it's unbelievable.
What is going on my Super Saiyan Witches, Ramstar here, and today we have a major Dragon Ball Super Spoil to discuss in regard to the next arc. Now, I don't want to ruin the series for anybody, so if you accidentally click this video, feel free to leave the video right now. Those who want to discuss, uh, stick around, but those who want to leave and want no spoilers to be, I don't know, entering your brain, then this is your one chance to leave. Now, we know that the new arc is coming up very, very soon, and the current one with Zamasu and Goku Black is going to end this weekend. The finale is coming up. And we have four episode titles as well to talk about, which I'll cover later. But the interesting part is what the next uh, arc is about, according to the scan that was just released by Productions.com. Hit is coming back. That's so exciting to hear. Hit is freaking coming back to Dragon Ball Super. I mean, it was kind of inevitable because the Universal Tournament was supposed to take place sometime in the future. And they did mention that it's going to be a tournament between the different universes. And I assume that Shapo was going to bring back the same team. With probably a couple changes, but he was going to probably bring back the same like major characters like Kabe. And, and hit but hit come back right now has you super excited just because of how they're setting this arc up let's just say that so according to the translated synopsis from v-jump goku is in danger the strongest assassin comes to the seventh universe to kill goku the assassin is ordered by an unknown individual so it looks like somebody put a hit out on goku no pun intended like literally put hit out on goku for whatever reason now the one thing that we learned about hit is obviously he's been around for a very long time he's a, a really good assassin in fact he's probably the best assassin that exists across all universes i mean that's why he's been basically hired by everybody and the thing about him is it, even though hit has kind of developed like a relationship with goku after that fight in the universal tournament not universal tournament in the uh, shop arc tournament he still seems to be like the kind of character where it's like well i guess if i gotta kill you i'm gonna go make the donuts i'm gonna go do what i gotta do because this is my job and if he does get you know ordered to kill goku for whatever reason then he's going to carry out. Now, what we're going to discuss in a couple of seconds is going to the next episode titles, and that's the part where it gets very interesting. November 27th, which is next week, is titled Come Forth Shenron, whose, sh whose wish shall be granted. Now, the question about this is, is why to summon Shenron? My first thought is, is probably to undo everything that Zamasu has done. I mean, we know that he destroyed the Super Dragon Balls, apparently, and uh, he also kind of screwed up the future. So as far as what they're going to do with Dragon Balls with, the only theory I can think about is to kind of restore order for what Zamasu has destroyed. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. What could they possibly be wishing for? But for all we know, this wish might even just be for the filler arc. Although I don't really think they would abuse the power like that. But then again, this is Dragon Ball and I can't really predict anything that's gonna happen at this point. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below what they're going to wish for. December 4th is interesting, and this is going to be, I guess, the official start of the little mini filler arcs that do between every single major arc. December 4th is titled, Goku vs. Arale, The Earth Comes to an End Due to Their Battle. Now, what's interesting about that is, is they're promoting Arale a lot, and I feel like what they're going to do, ultimately, is bring back Dr. Slump in some shape or format. Now, I know in Dokkan, they've been promoting Arale a lot. I mean, a lot. There was an event, they would share their own banner. Every day when you log in and play the game, you can get a free Arale card. Like, they've been promoting Arale a lot. Um, and I feel like the only reason they would do that is because if they're going to prepare some kind of, like, major major thing around you know dr slump so i feel like they could bring him back who knows uh i do know that you know a couple weeks ago when goku was trying to learn his, how to use his body again after it got basically destroyed by the kaioken blue you know when he was like instant transmission around we saw o'reilly briefly there but uh she's come back again and looks like she's gonna be facing off with, with goku for whatever reason maybe they're gonna spar or something i mean this is obviously a filler-esque episode where it's nothing too major and a quick sparring session could be a fun little episode to watch in case you didn't know arale is very powerful and she could actually destroy the earth so i really wonder how this episode is gonna play out but again don't think about too much of it if you see goku go super saiyan blue find out fall against arale uh 
don't think too much of it. <laughs> this is meant to be a fun filler episode, like a little in-between thing before the next major arc happens. Now, December 11th, the title is Challenge from Shampa, Let's Fight in Baseball. And we have Shampa back in action. Again, just like with the hit comeback, Shampa's back, and there's going to be another filler episode where they're basically pay, playing baseball. I guess this is uh, Shampa's version of trying to get, you know, back at beers or whatever. And that could be also a fun episode. But the real interesting part is what happens on December 18th. Goku dies, assassination order that must be performed. Now the first thing I want to say realistically speaking is death in Dragon Ball is a joke. You die, you're back tomorrow. I mean, obviously. If Goku does indeed die, that's not the end of it. He's going to come back. You know, he's going to get brought back by the Super Dragon Balls, the regular Dragon Balls, something, who knows. He's going to come back. But the thing is, is uh, the, the thing that I find really interesting is the fact that they just use the Dragon Balls. So how will Goku come back? Unless they have to use the Namaki Dragon Balls, in which case, that's going to be kind of tough because only Goku has instant transmission. Unless, I guess, they use Supreme Kai, maybe even Whis to go to, to new Namek. But either way, they just use the new Dragon Balls, and if Goku does indeed die, how will he come back? And two, what is it about uh, this next arc that's been, like, wh why is it happening, basically? Number one, who put out a hit on Goku? Number two, how will this even work? Like, hey, sorry, man, you know, I know we're friends and all, but I, I gotta kill you, man. I just have so many questions, and none of this will get answered right now just because all we have is episode titles. So I am really stuck with December 18th. Now, again, I can't tell if this is going to be the next major arc right now or the start of the next major arc or what the deal is. I know they were going to announce the next major arc in December, and obviously this is what leaked now. So I can't tell if this is all part of like, this mini filler arc where, you know, it's kind of a joke, or this next arc starts on December 18th with Goku dying, and then, like, you know, Hit comes back, and then they have to kind of figure out what's going on, what's happening, and kind of go from there. So a lot of questions. I mean, if Goku does die, I'm kind of hoping that that arc has more of a focus on other characters like maybe Gohan Vegeta bring Gohan back hashtag make Gohan great again or uh, maybe even like bring back Kabe as well but there's a lot of potential for this arc and I'm super excited just because I was not a big fan of the Dragon Ball Super Shampa arc but I love the characters the characters are make that arc so great and I can't wait to see them come back and hopefully it's going to be as epic as the Zamasu Black arc was the one thing I do want to say is you're probably wondering well how does Hit do it Goku's so powerful well, no matter how powerful you are, you can be the strongest person in existence. If you get murdered, you get murdered. That's it. Like, there's assassins who were trained to do this, who've been doing this for a long time. And hit, he's over a thousand years old. He's been doing this for a very, very long time. He received the best Hitman in uh, all universes title for a reason. Well, technically it was Universe 6, but according to this, he's the best, universe, best assassin ever. He received that title for a reason, is basically what I'm saying. And what we saw on Dragon Ball in the past, if you drop your guard, it's very easy to basically get knocked out. I mean, the big example was when Goku was shot by a ray gun in the Resurrection F arc and then went down. Now, add a trained assassin who lives to kill in that equation. No matter how powerful you are, he can still take you out. And he even himself said in the Shampa arc tournament that no matter how powerful you are, you will not survive my attacks if I keep hitting you in your vital points. I mean, that's just how it is. Like, if you're very, very strong and I come up to you and rip out your heart, that's it. You're done. We do know that uh, Hit has these crazy lethal attacks that he did not use in a tournament just because he wasn't allowed to. And I wonder if we we'll actually get a first glimpse of these abilities in uh, episode 18, or not episode 18, on December 18th, when they uh, show up the episode where apparently Goku dies. So, I don't know. Let me know your thoughts down below on the whole Hit versus Goku thing and the fact that Goku supposedly is going to die, any predictions you have, and I just kind of discuss his overall as a community. But either way, I'm hyped. Like I said, I'm a huge hit fan. You guys already know this, especially if you've been watching my Xenos 2 videos. I cannot wait to see this man come back and what he's going to do next. On top of that, the potential. The potential. I mean, the hit that we saw in the Shop arc was like a starter pack hit. This hit is going to come back. It's going to come back meaner, stronger, more powerful than ever. And on top of that, he's going to have new abilities. He's got us. So I'm excited to see what Toriyama is cooking up for us, as well as the Toei team. And I cannot wait to see which direction Dragon Ball Super takes us next. So yeah. Anyways, if you're hyped for this news, make sure you punch that like button twice as hard. And uh, any other comments, feedback, just drop my comment down below. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed us today. My name is Ryan Style, and I'll see all you guys in Super Sandwiches in the comment section below. Hashtag hit, and I'll see you guys down below. Peace. This was the most viewed episode in the history of Dragon Ball Super. But so many people were focused on Vegito that they missed out on all the easter eggs and hidden messages throughout the episode. There were a bunch of bible references, some animation mistakes, and we actually have the songs that they used throughout the episode. We don't just do in-depth videos, 
we do in-depth analysis. But before we begin, my friends over at Swag Wave just created an incredible stop motion of Goku Black versus Beerus. Destruction Wave! You guys need to subscribe to their YouTube channel and watch that video. If you're Dragon Ball Super fans, you're going to love Beerus versus Goku Black. Subscribe to Anime Live Reactions for more. Share this video with your friends. Let's begin with the opening images. There's a throwback to the end of episode 65. And in that episode, they foreshadowed the connection that Haru and Maki have with future trunks and this actually explains why they actually showed up on the broken sword because there is a lot of symbolism going on here because these are the two youngest kids that we've seen so far and because they represent the next generation that broken sword is pretty much representing that they're never gonna grow old enough to reach adulthood but if trunks succeeds they're going to live and become adults so that is why he has that deep connection with them and why he was able to grow the sword into adulthood just like he wants those kids to grow into adults and here's something that you may have missed that's not supposed to be warrior but warriors not with an s but an apostrophe so it's supposed to be possessive not singular the animation in this episode was absolutely crispy and a lot of people may consider that natoshi shida was the man behind the episode but that's not actually true while he was involved in the episode he didn't have the biggest role because there were a ton of other animators pretty much Dragon Ball super had their best animators all in one episode and that is why this episode looked absolutely crispy and beautiful but it was not just Natoshi Shida he is the most famous but he wasn't the only person working on this now that song that you heard right there that's actually not coming from Dragon Ball Super OST in fact that song is coming from the Dragon Ball Kai 2014 OST titled Reviving Majin Buu. Let me play it for a little bit. Thank you so much, Norihito Sumitomo. That wasn't the only song. We actually have two more songs from that album, and I'm gonna show you what those songs are somewhere in this video. But I also want you to pay attention to this shot right here because. Can you guess who is going to be the Omni King's friend that Goku was talking about? Can you guess? Well, remember, the Omni King said that he needs a friend and he's going to be in the next episode. But we have the answer pretty much being foreshadowed here. And I believe that Jajirobi is going to be that character. That's going to be the character that's going to be the Omni King's best My friend. Name because I don't see any other reason why he was brought back to the series besides to prove that point. And it makes a lot of sense actually. His personality, even in front of Boma, he's able to pick his nose. This guy just doesn't care. So he is the perfect friend for the Omni King. Now I wanna clarify this because Goku did not surpass Mirza Masu. The only reason that Goku was able to land a few punches and kicks was because Zamasu was so surprised and so in shock that he didn't even move he didn't even know what was happening and that's how goku was able to land a few punches but they actually made an animation mistake in this shot so pay attention to this now you see the ring of light behind him right now take a look at the next frame it's gone it disappeared the ring of light is gone but then if you look in the next frame it's there again so they definitely did an animation mistake and there's a few more throughout the episode now some people were confused why goku said kaioken but why the subtitle said king kai fist so let me actually clarify this thanks to herms herms says that kaioken kyle basically means world king lord of worlds by the viz media translation or king kai the funimation translation now ken means fist and that's usually an extension to the end of an attack like solar flare in japanese it is taioken which means sun fist attack so crunchyroll decided to basically replace kyle with king kai and then translate ken so it is king kai fist 
it makes a lot of sense but now i want you to pay attention to this move that goku did because that's not the first time we actually see this we actually saw this move in the resurrection of a special where they actually reanimated scenes from goku versus frieza and goku does the move right there now in the great words of the wise geek the 101 i was a great prognosticator because hours before the episode came out i actually gave an accurate explanation as to what would happen in the episode and why zamasu had a weakness let's listen to this this happened right before the episode you can't be immortal and not be immortal at the same time so that is a conflict of interest and that my friends is gonna be zamasu's biggest weakness because the potara earrings are not going to decide which one is better are we gonna take the immortality or are we not gonna take the immortality so you know what it does it takes both now the subtitle said that haru calls trunks trunks but that's not actually what he calls him in reality he calls him Onichan, which actually means like older brother so that was a little weird that they didn't do that in the animation uh, in the subtitles but that's okay but that's not the only reason why i have this shot pay attention to the guy behind my notice that he has a shirt on well look in the next frame he suddenly doesn't have a shirt it's gone but then in the frame after that the shirt is back so that was an animation mistake and every episode has a bunch of animation mistakes but i'm not gonna point to every single one of them or else this would be like a one hour video goku says last time when we fused they said we wouldn't be able to part again and what he's actually referring to is the old kai hey how long will the people stay joined for old kai the power of the earrings has no time limit it lasts forever and i'm actually gonna be doing a video that it's, it's called an anime theory and it's going to reveal the real reason that vegeto has a one hour limit and it's not what you think okay it's a hidden message so i'm gonna be doing that video over the weekend hopefully for next week but anyways right now uh he explains but we did we did diffuse why is that and this actually makes a nation Basically, as soon as the force field was brought down, he defused. But there's also controversy that maybe it exactly hit the one hour limit when they actually let the shield down. So guys, I'm definitely going to clarify that in my anime theory video. When Vegeta comes in this episode, he says, oh, right. And that's actually a direct throwback to the same way that he made an entrance the first time we ever saw him in Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> but now I want you to pay attention to the music that's playing in the background during this scene. You may think that that's coming from Dragon Ball Super OST, but in fact it is not. Again, this one is coming from the Dragon Ball Kai 2014 OST, and the title of the song is Super Saiyan 3. I found it interesting that instead of saying Goku, uh, Vegeta says Kakarot. And some of you may be confused, like, why does Vegeta and Kakarot make Vegito? Well, in English, it doesn't make that much sense, but in Japanese, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I'm so happy they decided to say Vegito Blue instead of Super Saiyan Blue Vegito. That would be so much more complicated. I love the irony here because Zamasu keeps talking about how the gods are too beautiful and in fact he was beautiful until this episode when he became ugly so the moment he became ugly that basically symbolizes that he is a goner now pay attention to the music in this scene that song all right i'm not going to talk about every single song but this is going to be the last song that i mentioned but again that's not coming from the dragon ball super ost this one is coming from the dragon ball kai 2014 OST and the title of this song is no more for the second time Vegito uses the spirit sword and it looks absolutely epic now Mirzamasu is doing something similar but instead it is called the fierce god slicer 
which is a variation of the one that Goku Black uses, which is called the God Split Cut, which is a variation of the one that features Zamasu uses, which is called the Aura Slide. Thanks to Xenoverse 2, of course. Now here we have a Bible reference because Zamasu says, I have taken the sins of mortals and the failure of gods in this body. And that is very similar to John chapter 1 verse 9, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in fact, Zamasu does want to take the sins of the world because he does say it for the world. So there are a ton of Bible references and there's a few more coming up. And here is the second Bible reference because Zamasu says why gods and mortals share similar forms and that is a direct reference to Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them so I love the fact that the writers are very intelligent to make these references and connections. Now remember how in the beginning of this video I talked about these two characters having a connection with Trunks? Well right here it is showing that again because he was able to create a sword out of a broken sword but this is not just an ordinary sword this is a sword of God and the way the reason I say that is because this is a direct reference to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and it says the sword of the life spirit which is the Lord of God. So that is from Ephesians 6, 17. And again, that is the reference with the sword of trunks. And because this is the Lord of God and the sword of the spirit, that is why Future Trunks was able to stab him and pretty much kill him. Well, not fully kill him just yet, but definitely destroy his body because of the symbolism that this sword represents. This sword represents the life of God, the spirit, of life of all the people on earth now a lot of you probably noticed this but the final kamehameha that's actually coming straight from the video games and i'm so happy that they made a canon don't worry guys we're almost to the end so now we have a clash of swords you got the clash of a false god which is mirza mas remember the two young kids they said that he is the false god but now you have the sword of an actual god and the spirit of people and that is the one that Future Trunks holds. Now, one thing that I found interesting is that Android 8 is actually giving off energy to Trunks and even though he's an android, he still has the life force inside of him. Even the sea turtle at the Kame house is giving him life force and that is how Future Trunks is able to create the Genki Dama and put it into a sword so you might as well call it the spirit sword i kind of like the way that sounds now this shot right here is actually a direct throwback to episode 57 except back then he was immortal so that didn't have any effect on him but now it's payback time and i really love the way they connect episodes by episodes and i love doing this analysis what i also find interesting is that future trunks is not having it he goes straight for the nuts, all right? He goes from the nuts upwards, which is very different how he did it against Frieza. Back in the day, he actually went up and down. So this is really showing you that he has no love, sympathy, or mercy for Mirza Masu. He wants him to suffer by the balls for killing all those innocent people. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure you support my good friends at Swag Wave and watch that video of Super Saiyan Rose Goku Black versus Lord Beerus. You guys are going to be really mind blown at the quality of the animation, the stop motion, the voice actors, absolutely insane. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel and check them out. Watch that video and share it with your friends. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Dragon Ball Super Episode 67 will mark the end of Zomasu. We will have to say goodbye to Future Trunks as well. For the first time ever, we might get to see the most powerful character of Dragon Ball Universe, the Omni King displaying his powers. The last episode was the best action-packed episode of DBS, and the hype is at its peak. Episode 67 wrapped things up and can be considered as the season finale if you don't count the filler or in between the arc types of episodes that we will get before every arc. Now, the fans are really excited for it and there are a lot of questions regarding the next episode. In this video, you will get Dragon Ball Super Episode 67 preview breakdown and predictions. 
Before the analysis, let's check out the episode 67 preview summary. Dragon Ball Super episode 67 title is Feel Your Heart with New Hope, Farewell Trunks, airing date November 20th. Will they be able to protect the future? The final battle with Zamasu. Powered by the hopes of humanity, Trunks strikes back at Zamasu. But while Zamasu was supposed to be defeated, he instead loses his physical body and begins his journey out and covering the sky. Goku this week, finding the last ace up his sleeve to counter Zamasu. Now that Zamasu has lost his physical body, Goku and company are once more are in dire straits. Just when all hope seems lost, Goku finds something in his pocket. Thanks to Harms for the translation. The last episode ended with Future Trunks stunningly slicing Zamasu in half using his spirit sword. Trunks suffered most for Zamasu and obviously was more emotionally invested in all this. So he deserved to land the final blow. However, from the previous story, we know this is not the end of Zamasu. They basically managed to destroy the physical body of Zamasu, but Zamasu has not been totally annihilated. Basically, the immortality of Zamasu was affected when he fused with the mortal black. Super Shenron had granted immortality to Zamasu. The Gotara fusion went wrong on many different levels. Like Vegito mentioned, Zamasu fused with Zamasu Black's body, he had Goku's mortal body. Also, Gawasu points out how the buffed up form of Zamasu represents the contradictions and hate in his mind. Anyways, all that combined nullified immortality of Zamasu's physical body. Vegito's spirit sword hurt him and made it very clear. However, since Zamasu was still a half of the fusion and he can't die, in a way, the immortality wasn't totally nullified. So when Franz sliced him, he lost his physical body, but his spirit or mind remained. This is sparkles you see probably represent that, and even without a body, Zamasu would still attempt to cause chaos. From the preview, we know Zamasu will then cover the sky. So guys, there will be a bit more action before they wrap things up. Now since Zamasu doesn't even have a body, Goku and company won't be able to finish it. Goku usually is not the type of guy who would seek help to win a fight. But come on, Zamasu doesn't even have a body. It is not a fight anymore. So Goku finds the only button in his pocket that has given to him back in episode 5 by Zeno. Using that, Zeno can be summoned anytime, anywhere. Finally, the button will get pressed and Omni King will appear. In the background of this image, the sky looks way darker and unusual than the last episode. So probably Zamasu was still covering the sky when Zeno appeared. It is pretty clear that Zeno will have a role in wrapping things up with Zamasu, but the question is, how? Will he just annihilate him, or will he instead just make it easier for Bronx or others to seal him down using the evil demon king or the sword or something like that? There is a confusion regarding the timeline barrier.